Madam Ambassador, Mr. Chairman, distinguished delegates. Uh, today, I'm going to, going to talk about uh, an issue which is of uh, much concern to all of us in the future, and in particular to uh, the astronomers. Uh, and that is access to the sky, to the night sky, and to space in general. What you see here on this first slide uh, gives you an indication of what we are up against. It's a group of galaxies imaged by a uh, large observatory with CCD detectors, totally obliterated by streaks produced by uh, Starlink satellites. Starlink being the uh, system that uh, SpaceX is establishing right now to provide global uh, internet coverage for the, uh, uh, for the world. Let's put this in context. In, it was the mid 1960s when we realized that we had to take telescopes away from large cities and we had to place them into uh, favorable uh, areas, favorable for observing. And uh, so we took them to the American Southwest, uh, Arizona, New Mexico, to Hawaii in the middle of the Pacific Ocean on top of a uh, volcano and to the Atacama Desert in Chile on the Southern Hemisphere. For example, the European Southern Observatory built the La Silla telescope in the mid 60s, initially with a 1.5 meter telescope and uh, a 3.6 meter telescope was being planned. Back then, the nearest uh, population center, the uh, number of inhabitants there was uh, 100,000 in the La Serena Coquimbo area. This is now uh, 500,000 with the corresponding economic activity and traffic activity. Uh, our telescopes have grown from 1.5 meters to 8 meters in diameter, which means 50 square meters of mirror, more than 25 times the reflecting area that we used to have. And our detectors have all also improved. We, are, we had photographic plates back then, and only and for photographic plates, we only used 2%, or rather the photographic plate only used 2% of the incoming energy uh, to register a signal. We now have CCDs, which use 98% uh, of the incoming signal for registration, which means that our telescope detector combinations are about a thousand times better. And very soon we will have telescopes in the range of 30 meters of diameter. So the factor will be about 5,000. And that in, turns, in turn means we have a real problem. So activities so far, Klaus Matzen, who represented ESO, European Southern Observatory, Southern in that context means Southern Hemisphere, in Copus, started to work the issue when the mining activity in the Atacama Desert around Cerro Paranay, which is the location of the ESO very large telescope, four telescopes of eight meters in diameter, when the mining activity there increased considerably. He contacted the Chilean, or rather ESO contacted the Chilean authorities on the local and national level, and uh, they've been quite cooperative. I introduced new standards for light fixtures, and uh, there was a massive change of light fixtures in La Serena and Coquimbo, and dark uh, sky parks were created. But of course, the problem is not confined to ESO. There are other observatories, both in Chile and elsewhere. So Klaus wanted to extend this to all major observatories, and therefore he brought the issue to Copus. When Klaus retired in 2017, I took over from him. I immediately involved the International Astronomical Union, which has observer status in Copus, and Klaus's successor, Andrew Andy Williams, also became very active uh, within a short time, as soon as he came up to speed. Working with Piero Benvenuti, who was then the General Secretary of the IAU, and with others, we started the usual procedure that you are all uh, familiar with, a uh, non-paper, a conference room paper, oral statements, technical presentations. Uh, and in the end, we requested the workshop, uh, which was decided to be in Chile. Uh, of course, then the social unrest in Chile broke out, and uh, COVID broke out and uh, the workshop was delayed. 
Here is what happened in the, in that, in the La Serena Coquimbo area in uh, 2005, 2006. There was a massive replacement of more than 7,000 light fixtures and uh, it improved the situation considerably. Now, of course, considerably is relative. Uh, it's still a lot of light. Okay, more context. It was 2019 in May when I picked up uh, Aviation Weekend Space Technology. This is, for those who don't know, uh, the premier aerospace trade journal. And there was an innocent article in there, a couple of pages, saying that SpaceX was planning to launch more than 10,000 satellites into low Earth orbit to provide global internet services. Very interesting. And that one web was planning 4,000, and the US Air Force was planning 800, and that other companies and countries had similar plans. Extrapolation shows immediately that we had to expect 100,000 satellites in the next 10 years. Remarkably, none of this had been reported in the conference of the Scientific and Technical Subcommittee of UN COPUS, which had just uh, taken place several weeks earlier. Very interesting and a bit uh, disturbing. In the same time frame, there just happened to be, for other reasons, a high-level meeting at the UN, US National Academy of Sciences of top-level senior astronomers. Essentially, everybody who was anybody in astronomy was there. And so I was running around with the uh, uh, Aviation Week and Space Technology article in uh, my hand and showed everybody. And initially, I was met with disbelief and incredulity. But very soon, of course, uh, the American Astron Astronomical Society, uh, these people are very quick on their feet, and the International Astronomical Union assessed and confirmed the situation. Co uh, contact with SpaceX and OneWeb uh, was established immediately, and uh, we did get quite a bit of uh, consideration and collaboration. Of course, they were not going to change their plans. In the meantime, the astronomers, in particular the American Astronomical Society, organized uh, two conferences uh, to find uh, methods, technologies, and operational workarounds to mitigate the problem. So you might ask, why does Elon Musk you need uh, 10,000, 20,000 satellites uh, to provide uh, internet services? Well, the reason for that is uh, that the uh, traditional telecommunication satellites in a 24-hour uh, orbit at 36,000 kilometers, which means that the satellite rotates around the Earth in 24 hours, the Earth rotates in 24 hours, so the satellite seems to be stationary. That's why all the uh, TV dishes look at the same place in the sky. But the problem is light is fast, but it does take time. The signal travel time is considerable. It takes about three tenths of a second to go up to 36,000 kilometers and for, uh, to go up and down from 36,000 kilometers. So you click on your, you click your mouse and it takes 0.3 seconds for anything to happen. Another 0.3 seconds for the response, like loading an image, firing uh, the gun of your ego shooter game. And uh, even more, if more than one satellite is involved, if the signal like uh, you're trying to talk to somebody on the other side of the planet, then it involves more than one satellite. And that leads to a delay of up to two seconds. Uh, we often notice that when correspondents report on TV from faraway countries, and there is this uh, embarrassing pause between the question of the anchor person and the response of the, of the correspondent. Now, two seconds is uh, unacceptable for fast internet, because you're not gonna wait two seconds until something happens when you click your mouse. It's, it also requires quite powerful transmitters and receivers to talk to a satellite, which is 36,000 kilometers up. In low earth orbit, this of course is much faster. The satellite is much closer. Uh, it happens almost instantaneously, but the problem is now the satellites are so low, they don't see the whole hemisphere. They only see a small patch of a hemisphere. And so it needs a lot of satellites to cover uh, the, the whole surface, uh, which it works like a, a cell phone. When we, get, yeah, when we are in a car and we move among the cell phone towers, we get, it, we get handed off from one tower to another. In the uh, 
In this case, it's upside down. The cell phone towers, in other words, the satellites, they move and we are stationary or relative, uh, relatively stationary, but it's the same principle. The worrying thing is that the military has developed uh, a concept which is called attritable swarms. And that means that uh, if you have enough stuff up there, it doesn't matter if somebody shoots down a small number of them. Like if you have five GPS satellites and somebody takes out two of them, you have a problem. If you have 800 satellites and somebody takes out two of them, you couldn't care less. Uh, but incidentally, the first example of attritable swarms was the thousand uh, bomber attacks on German cities in World War II. Now, what's the problem with maker constellations? Uh, when the sun goes down and the, dark, uh, the sky gets dark, uh, the sun illuminates the satellites and uh, we see them. So before sunrise and after sunset, the satellites are visible to the naked eye. And given the number of satellites, in a dark night, you can see about 4,000 stars, uh, if it's reasonably dark, more in, in very dark situation. But if it's reasonably dark, it's 4,000 satellites, but there are 4,000 stars. But with 10, 20, 30,000 satellites up there, there will be more satellites than there are stars. Furthermore, nobody can convince me that there will not be collisions. Sure, Elon Musk says his satellites talk uh, to each other and they, they avoid each other. But what about one, if one fails? You cannot talk to a, to a failed satellite and it cannot take uh, uh, maneuvers. It cannot do maneuvers, evasive maneuvers. Uh, and in fact, uh, pretty soon after the uh, launch of the first batch of uh, Starlink satellites, there was a near collision, a near miss between SpaceX and the ESA satellite. SpaceX refused to move, ESA had to move. And the reason was that ESA, it was ESA, for ESA, it was one satellite. And for SpaceX, it was one of 120. So uh, the uh, evasion, evasion criteria for SpaceX are much lower than for, for ESA. Now collisions produce space debris because you know the object sort of explodes. And of course, space debris produces more collisions. And that is called the Kessel syndrome, when collisions uh, exponentially pro pro um, produce more fragments. That can be so serious that it is difficult to penetrate this shell of uh, space debris that's covering, the, uh, that, that, that's covering the Earth in low Earth orbit. Of course, these satellites illuminated, whether they're illuminated or not, uh, doesn't matter, they impact astronomical observations. Illuminated, at least we see them. We see that they impacted our observations, like you remember the first slide. But even if they're not illuminated, they impact our uh, observations because they occult our objects and we don't know that they did, which is even more serious. Uh, and that is true for optical and uh, ultraviolet, uh, ultraviolet observations, but it's true in particular for radio observations because all these uh, satellites talk to each other uh, on at radio wavelengths, and that uh, these are being received by the by our telescopes. It is indeed possible to work around to design operations uh, that uh, avoid some of these uh, problems and uh, limitations. And we can, to some extent, correct the data in software. Uh, but it, it doesn't really help to paintbrush the data because we are trying to measure energy output of uh, astrophysical sources to a, uh, an accuracy of uh, better than 1%. And if we, if, if we start paintbrushing the pixels, uh, we cannot be sure what we are, what we are measuring. Also, there is the real possibility that uh, the, uh, because of the, of the strong signal that these uh, objects uh, emit, they destroy our detectors, both in optical and in radio. And there's another problem, and I'm surprised that, had, that this hasn't been addressed uh, so far. 
it is very easy, it would be very easy for a terrorist organization or for a rogue nation to trigger the Kessler syndrome deliberately. And there are people on this planet who would enjoy uh, getting, uh, giving the West, in other words, us, a real problem by keeping them uh, from getting into space. So uh, what have we been doing? The IAU flag, IAU has observer status in Corpus, which uh, most of you will know. And uh, so IAU flagged the issue with Corpus and with UNO, so with the office, and uh, with the support of several countries, uh, we raised the awareness. Uh, we started an initiative called Dark and Quiet Skies for Science and Society, which uh, encompasses both the problem of artificial light at night, in other words, light pollution, and the second satellite, mega constellations. Input from the, from the community was solicited, from the astrophysical community was solicited, and a first virtual, unfortunately, uh, UN Spain IAU workshop was held about a year ago. Uh, about a thousand participants. I mean, it's very, it shows how important the, the problem is. The report that was produced uh, just recently came online. And here is the URL. We also contract, contacted the service, the satellite service provider. SpaceX, in particular, immediately started experiments uh, avoiding reflecting surfaces, uh, anodizing, uh, in other words, painting black some of the components, and putting sun visors on the spacecraft. The problem is, if you paint the satellite black, it'll soak up the sunlight and it'll uh, get warm and it will overheat. So there's a limit to what they can do. And also it turns out that the best reflecting surfaces are the antennas and the solar panels. And you cannot paint the solar panel back, black because it doesn't produce any power. So all you can do is uh, fly, uh, change the attitude of the satellite in such a way that, it, that the solar panels do not reflect uh, light to the surface of the Earth directly. Some of you might have seen an iridium flash, which is caused by the uh, solar panels of the iridium satellite reflecting uh, sunlight to where you to your position on the Earth, and it's really amazing. It's uh, it's it's like an explosion in the sky. Uh, in the meantime, we have held a second conference. In fact, uh, a couple of weeks ago on the island of La Palma in Santa Cruz. But this fell prey to the uh, eruption of the Cumbre Vieja volcano. So again, it was done in, in, in hyperspace in uh, as a virtual uh, conference. And again, we had about a thousand participants. Here is the conference poster. This, by the way, is the uh, uh, large telescope on, of the Roque de los Muchachos uh, Observatory in uh, La Palma. Uh, artificial light at night. The problem has been with us uh, for a long time and it's getting worse, even though mitigation measures are being taken. In the American Southwest, uh, the telescopes of the Kitt Peak National Observatory, uh, Stewart Observatory, multiple mirror telescopes and uh, multiple mirror telescope and others are located uh, essentially south of Tucson. And Tucson, uh, is the fastest one of the fastest growing cities in in the U.S. So uh, even though people are more aware of uh, the problem of artificial light at night, the problem is still increasing because there are more and more people, and more and more traffic, and more and more economic activity. Here is something that everybody has seen: uh, uh, the uh, the eastern part of the United States and west. Uh, the western part of Europe illuminated uh, beyond recognition. But the problem is, even in areas which used to be rather dark, we see a, a significant increase. So in the four years between 2012 and 2016, this is what happened in India. And ex extrapolation shows that it's going to be as bright as Western Europe within a short time. So in a nutshell, uh, artificial light in, at night uh, and the problems are it, of course, disturbs the natural wake and sleep rhythm of everybody, uh, of life, even plant life. 
it kills insects by the millions. Uh, there are interesting videos showing how insects congregate around lights, and if the lights produce any temperature at all, the, they, they fall out of the sky. Of course, if there are no insects, there are all the animals uh, that feed on insects, they will die. Uh, it also makes people sick. Uh, you, you don't get uh, a good night's sleep if uh, your bedroom is being illuminated by street lights or by uh, the headlights of passing cars. Basically, it wastes energy. It uh, blows energy it, uh, uh, up to the sky, of course. And interestingly enough, it doesn't, uh, most people seem to think that uh, if an area is well illuminated, it is a secure area. That's wrong. Because what happens is, if the area is dark, nobody goes there in the first place. If the area is illuminated, people go there because they think it's safe, but their eyes are adapted to uh, bright lights and they don't see what happens in the shade. And in the shade is where the perpetrator is. So uh, illuminated areas at night help the perpetrator more than it helps the victim. Now, what can we do about it? She did light fixtures, there are countless designs. <sighs> Some of them are being followed even. We can make sure that light gets only gets switched on if there is demand. It's also a bit of a problem because if I wanna go there, but I'm not there yet, uh, how can I tell the light fixture to come on? I cannot walk around with a remote control. It, strict regulations are required, and of course, they have to be enforced. There are many technological solutions as far as um, the uh, light sources are concerned, as far as wavelengths are concerned, temperature, color temperature is concerned, and frequencies are concerned. And basically, it requires a lot of discipline on everybody's part to follow all these uh, rules and regulations and recommendations. Moving on. Okay, there he is, uh, the recommendations of the uh, workshop that was held in, uh, a, a year ago and that was presented to the uh, Scientific and Technical Committee in virtual space uh, in April uh, 2021. So uh, we need to protect the ground-based uh, optical observatories because, and that's a, a consideration that uh, is uh, of some importance, these things cost money. A major observatory, a four meter telescope, eight meter telescope, they are uh, they cost between a half a billion and a billion uh, euros, dollars, what have you. And you want to protect these uh, investments. Uh, if, you, if you start uh, pumping light in the sky, uh, making them useless, you've just lost a billion dollars. Uh, the conference room paper recommends defining no light areas around the observatories, eliminate direct illumination or <coughs> above the horizontal, only below horizontal, and suppressing the blue light content, the high energy con uh, content of light. Of course, uh, a nice, um, quiet, dark sky is also something of importance to the, uh, the citizens, to the population, because you know, there's this romantic uh, impression of uh, in, uh, evening, starry sky and all that. We hardly ever see that, certainly not around, uh, around uh, urban centers. And of course, we need to protect the bioenvironment. Moving on to satellite maker constellations and astrophysics. Here is the typical uh, detector array of a major telescope. <coughs> Uh, with the uh, taken uh, with the Victor Blanco telescope, it's a four meter telescope on uh, Cerro Tololo in Chile. What you see is uh, a field with stars and galaxies totally destroyed by passing Starlink satellites. Now, uh, if you start, then you could, of course, start can uh, wonder about uh, how to correct. Is it possible and how would you correct that? Now it turns out it's, it's not really possible because if you look at these trails uh, a, at a higher magnification, you find out that not only do these trails saturate the detector, they, it also has an impact on the detector so that after the satellite passes, the detector 
these pixels of the detector change the performance characteristic. And there are also ghost images, internal reflections in the detector. And you can see the, uh, the, the, the parallel uh, streaks here. So uh, in, in other words, this um, observation is essentially useless. Now for a small telescope, uh, okay, uh, we'll step back. We have to expect tens of thousands to be launched in the next decade. So uh, we have to figure out uh, something uh, what we can do about it. One, uh, of course, an obvious way is to, to limit, to impose on the satellite uh, service providers to make do with a, the, the minimum number of satellites that they can get away with, and also to uh, make sure that the, uh, that the satellites are at an altitude which does not uh, or provides minimum interference with astronomical observations, because the higher the satellites are, the, the longer, the, the better they are visible in uh, uh, during the night. But as I said, uh, a, a, a visible satellite just means we know that a satellite has been there. In a non-illuminated satellite, we don't know that it was there, but it will still affect the, the observations, not uh, in the sense that it uh, injects energy into the observations, it, it, it reduces the energy of uh, astronomical objects by occulting them. Uh, here, see, here you see uh, the effects of uh, raising uh, the orbit of, of a satellite. In, the, uh, in, in astronomy, larger number means fainter. So uh, in the uh, in the 500 uh, kilometer orbit, during the uh, there will be areas there will be times during the night when when the uh, uh, satellites are not visible. In a, at a higher orbit, they will be uh, visible. So we want to minimize the operational altitude, and we want to minimize the number of satellites and minimize the time to spend in in in, uh, in orbit. Another recommendation is to design the satellites in such a way that uh, they, their, their brightness is fainter than sixth magnitude. Sixth magnitude is by definition the brightness of a celestial object that you can still see with the naked eye. So if uh, satellites are fifth and uh, fourth magnitude, then you can see them extremely well. If they are designed in such a way that they, even when illuminated, are below sixth magnitude, then you cannot, at least you cannot see them with the naked eye. Of course, with the telescope, with an eight meter telescope, uh, there's no problem. <laughs> you see them. Uh, in particular, with the new generation of telescopes that we are uh, building right now. This is the Vera Rubin telescope. Vera Rubin uh, was a, uh, an astronomer who essentially discovered dark energy by showing that uh, uh, galaxies do not rotate uh, the way we would have naively expected them to rotate. And that indicates uh, that uh, there must be uh, matter in the, uh, around the around galaxies that we don't see. And so this is dark matter. And in the meantime, we also have reason to believe that uh, there is uh, what we call dark energy, which causes the acceleration of the expansion of the universe. In order to uh, detect that or uh, find out the possible cause, what we need to do is take large areas, take exposures on large areas of the sky and uh, compare them, take them over long, long periods of time and compare them uh, and add them up in order to go deep into, the, uh, into space. So the, uh, the, the Rubin telescope, previously known as the Large Scale Synoptic Telescope, uh, is, an, is an eight meter telescope. So uh, the, the diameter here is eight meters. And this is the infrastructure that you need to operate such a telescope. What we have here is the camera. This is the camera, you see the size of the, of the telescope. And it is a very sophisticated piece of uh, technology. 
it allows to uh, shield uh, sev several areas uh, to uh, uh, interrupt exposures. And that, that will actually help because we will, uh, I'll tell you about this later, we will uh, coordinate with the satellite providers. We can actually stop the exposure if we know that we, we will experience a satellite overflight. It will still be enormously difficult. Uh, and the reason is the following. What you see here is the detector array. It's a, it's a full-scale mock-up of the, of the detector array. Of course, it's a mock-up because you don't handle CCDs in that manner. But the detector array consists of all 90 CCDs uh, at 16 megapixels each. And it will take a frame every 15 seconds of an area which is very, very large. You see here the full moon? And the full area is significantly larger than the full moon. And we get uh, a, an exposure every 15 seconds. And the, the principle is uh, we do near, near real time data analysis. Uh, we identify the millions of objects on these, on these uh, uh, detector arrays. And those objects that are unchanged from exposure to exposure, these we co add. We add up uh, so we get deeper and deeper and deeper into the universe. The uh, objects which either change from exposure to exposure, we flag as interesting. And objects which change position from exposure to exposure, we call them asteroids, near Earth asteroids, potentially hazardous uh, asteroids. So, but imagine if a, if a Starlink satellites move through uh, through this area, and given the size of this area, there will always be satellites tra satellite trails through this. So this will there will not be a single observation without uh, multiple trails. This is uh, going to be a real problem for the data analysis. So this is what we are recommending for uh, mitigating the impact of satellite constellations on, on astronomy. We uh, want to conduct the operations in such a way that uh, they uh, have minimum impact effect on the astronomical observations. We need to uh, put restrictions on the satellite uh, satellite licensing uh, licensing licensing requirements. But right now, it's very it's it, there's almost no limit of what you can fling into space, and we need to we need to uh, put some restrictions on that. Uh, guidelines for operational standards to take uh, in, uh, into account the impact on various other parties that are interested in this area of the in, in low Earth orbit and, 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 and uh, observing through this shell of, uh, of satellites. We want to uh, support and expand uh, the uh, development of space domain decision intelligence. In other words, we want to make uh, certain that uh, what happens up there it happens in a coordinated manner that everybody knows where everybody else's satellite is and if a problem uh, develops, uh, it can be taken care of before uh, the satellites collide. And of course, all this uh, needs uh, people, computer resources, and uh, uh, we need um, funding for that. Now, it turns out, and some of you, most of you uh, already know that, that the electromagnetic sp uh, spectrum extends from very short wavelengths, in other words, gamma rays to, to X-rays to the optical. And this, this narrow band is where, where our eye works uh, to the infrared. In other words, uh, uh, red light, infrared light, uh, heat, and the longest radio waves uh, with the wavelengths of, of, of hundreds of meters and kilometers. Now, the brown area means the signal doesn't get through the atmosphere. You see that even in the optical, there is considerable attenuation. And then in the infrared, there are several windows. Uh, and there's a large window from several centimeters to uh, several tens of meters uh, where most of the uh, radio astronomy hap uh, happens. 
and and alma the uh, millimeter and submillimeter radio uh, observatory works in in those windows and we can only do that if we avoid some of the attenuation here by going high 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 up in the atmosphere because uh, as we every 5500 meters the atmosphere uh, atmospheric pressure goes down by half so at 5500 meters we only look through half of the atmosphere but of course only, only we only have half the air pressure so, which makes life up there uh, rather difficult now from space of course uh, there is none of that but the problem is in space we are size limited because we cannot fling uh, huge uh, antennas into into space and these antennas are really huge uh, this is alma the atacama large millimeter array well, millimeter because that's the wavelength uh, that we are observing in and large because it's a large array so it's 66 antennas 12 meters in diameter each and it synthesizes in other words uh, we can reconstruct with the uh, signals received by these antennas we can reconstruct a virtual mirror of the diameter of the of the distance of the size of the largest distance between any of these antennas so we have an, a virtual antenna of several hundred meters in diameter which we can use to produce images now this is an image of a uh, young star with a with a uh, protoplanetary disk in fact it's a protoplanetary ring because from that disk a planet evolving planet has already carved out the innermost part and in fact if you look closely this planet again has a disk around it from which a moon will con condense out now why is it you might ask that the star is relatively faint and the uh, um, protoplanetary ring is relatively bright well that's the whole secret of alma uh, alma receives signals from matter which is uh, very very cold uh, less than 100 degrees or so uh, around 100 degrees cold the star the surface uh, temperature of the star is several thousand degrees so we don't get a signal from the star in these wavelengths but we get plenty of signal from the protoplanetary proto ring and from the protoplanet and this is what we observe with alma among other things uh, and this is what we cannot do from space because we cannot take alma into space at least not yet so recommendations for radio astronomy the problem there is that it is really easy to burn out given the size of the antenna to burn out uh, the detector of the uh, of the radio observatory the other problem is it doesn't uh, matter if the uh, beam is directed straight at the observatory all antennas have um, all uh, transmitters have what is called side lobes so around the the beam around this core of the beam there are rings uh, that are also filled with signal so even though the uh, satellite is not look, looking directly at, at, at uh, alma the side lobes might affect alma and given the um, detectors and the size of the antennas uh, that uh, alma and other observatories of course the side lobes might be enough to destroy uh, the detectors so there are more recommendations in the conference room paper the non-geostationary satellites in other words those that are moving around that appear to be moving around especially those that emit radar and high power signals must not a, i'm not saying should be should be able but must avoid direct illumination of a radio telescope it must not be beam, beam directed to the radio telescope and in fact not uh, even to the radio quiet zones which are defined around uh, observatories these radio observatories are deliberately placed in locations with very low uh, uh, radio, uh, radio noise and then uh, some communication satellite moves across and and plasters the whole area with high with a high power signal and the side lobes should be such that uh, the, uh, they don't interfere with the observations 
So what is it that we are going to do? We will continue to work uh, with you and OSA and uh, also continue to work uh, with uh, national and international agencies like the International Telecommunications Union. Uh, these are the first people who find out about these satellites because the first thing that uh, Elon Musk has to, uh, uh, has to do is ask for frequencies to be assigned to his uh, satellites. And on the national level, uh, within uh, organizations like the Federal Aviation Authority. In fact, the IAU is uh, about to install an, a dedicated office to coordinate between astronomy industry, the governments, and the United Nations. It's, uh, we call it the SAT Hub Office, and it will provide uh, lists, databases, and tools for observatories to. Uh, find out when uh, satellites have to be expected. So we can interrupt the observations, uh, close down uh, for, a, for a certain time, close down the, 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 the camera, power down the cameras or the, uh, the, the receivers. And uh, also uh, provides information for the satellite operators to make it possible for them to avoid the uh, illuminating uh, sensitive radio antennas. Yes, we will continue to work with the satellite service pro providers. We will try to get them to avoid uh, highly reflecting surfaces, to install sun visors. These uh, turn out to be fairly effective. To keep the optical brightness below seventh magnitude, to uh, preserve the uh, pristine aspects of, uh, of the night sky, for the general population, um, uh, we want, want to make sure that uh, frequencies that are assigned to uh, satellite con uh, constellations, they are being adhered to. It turns out that over and over again, we find satellites that are uh, transmitting in frequency bands that they have no, uh, no authorization for. It. They do it anyway, but because what are you gonna do? Shoot them down? We have to minimize uh, side lobes, and we want to res we want them to respect the radio quiet zones around the observatories. Now, the really disquieting thing is we have absolutely zero idea what the military are doing, and nobody can convince me that they are not doing anything. We already know that uh, the U.S. Air Force is planning 800 satellites. But uh, the, among the military, the U.S. Air Force is a relatively transparent organization. Uh, there are, um, in Space Command, there are uh, organizations that are less open than the U.S. Air Force. And in other countries, there are certainly uh, military activities that uh, we know nothing about uh, and that hardly anybody knows anything about. So uh, here he is, uh, if you're interested. The report, uh, well, the uh, conference room paper, uh, uh, which is the basis for all the activities within the United Nations, and uh, the um, report of the first workshop on dark and quiet skies for science and society. The URLs are underneath. Uh, and with that, I want to thank you for your attention.